so from the beginning of enemy territory, I peered over a rotting tree stump and saw him moving without a helmet in the bushes. I got his forehead in my sights, squeezed the trigger, and imagined I saw the bullet puncture his head and blood trickle out. I got you, Jerome, I got you. Oh, you did not. I got you, you're dead. I must have sounded very definite because he compromised. You only wounded me. Tommy, Tommy, come here. Her voice came from high above me. I scrambled to my knees. What, ma? She was on the porch of our house next to the vacant lot where we were playing. Come here a minute, dear. I want you to do something for me. She was wearing a yellow dress. The porch was red brick. I hopped up and ran to the foot of our steps. She came to the top. Mr. Bixby left his hat. As I had walked, waited in ambush for Jerome, I had seen Mr. Bixby climb and an hour later chug down the steps. He was one of my father's poker playing friends. It was only after she mentioned it that I remembered Mr. Bixby had been wearing when he arrived a white wide brimmed Panama hat with a black band. Entering my parents' room on the second floor, I saw it on their bed. My mother picked it up. Walk it around to his house. Now walk, I say. Don't run because you'll probably drop it and ruin it. It was so white, a speck of dirt would have shone like a black star in a white sky. So walk, let me see your hands. I extended them palms up and she immediately sent me to the bathroom to wash. Then she gave me the hat. I did not really grip it, rather, with my finger in the crown, I balanced it as if to twirl it. When I stepped onto the porch again, I saw them playing on their corner, Valentine's Gang. Well, in this day of street gangs organized like armies, I cannot rightly call Joey Valentine, who was eight, and his acquaintances, who ranged in age from five to seven, a gang. It was simply that they lived on the next block, and since my friends and I were at the age when we were allowed to cross the street, but we're not yet used to this new freedom. We still stood on opposite sides of the asphalt strip that divided us and called each other names. It was not until I got onto the porch that I realized with a sense of dread that only a six-year-old can conjure up that Mr. Bixby lived one block beyond Valentine's territory. Still, with faith that the adult nature of my mission would give me unmolested passage, I approached the corner, which was guarded by a red fire alarm box, looked both ways for the cars that seldom came and swallowing began to cross over. They were playing with toy soldiers and tin tanks in the border of dry yellow dirt that separated the flagstones from the gutter. I was in the middle of the street when they first realized I was invading, they were shocked. At the time I can remember thinking, they must have been awed that I should have the unequaled courage to cross into their territory. But looking back, I realized it probably had little to do with me it was the hat, a white Panama hat. A more natural target for abuse has never existed. I was two steps from the curb when Joey Valentine moved into my path. Hey, what you got? Since he was obviously asking the question to show off, I bit my lip and did not answer. I saw myself as one of my radio heroes resisting Japanese interrogation. I was aloof. However, the white Panama hat was not at all aloof. Before I knew it, Joey Valentine reached out a mud-caked hand and knocked the hat off my finger to a resounding chorus of cheers and laughter. I scooped up the hat before any of them, retreated at a run across the street, and stopped beside the red alarm box. Wanting to save some small amount of my dignity, I screamed at them, I'll get you guys, I'll get you. I'm not really an American. I'm an African, and Africans are friends of the Japs, and I'll get them to bomb your house. But even as I ranted at them, I could see I was doing so in vain. Across the way, Valentine's gang lounged with the calm of moving Marines listening to Japanese propaganda on the radio. I turned toward my house, inspecting the hat for smudges. There were none. It was as blinding white as ever. Already I felt tears inching down my cheeks. Now until I was halfway up the porch steps, did I see my grandmother sitting in her red iron chair. But before I could say anything, before I could appeal for understanding and comfort, she lifted herself out of the chair and disappeared into the house. She had seen it all. I knew that, and she was too ashamed of me to face me. Suddenly, she was coming back, holding a broom handle. 
She had never before lifted a hand to me, but in my state, I felt sure that many things would change. I closed my eyes and waited. Instead of the crunch of hard wood on bone, I heard her chair, her chair creak. I opened my eyes and found the end of the broom handle under my nose. You know if you don't go back and deliver that hat, you'll feel pretty bad tonight. I nodded. We'll take this. We don't like you fighting, but sometimes you have to. So now you march down there and tell those boys if they don't let you alone, you'll have to hit them with this. Here, she pushed the broom handle at me. You know who Teddy Roosevelt was? I nodded. Well, he once said, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. I understood her, but to do something like this was still alien to my nature, I held back. Come on. She stood abruptly and took my hand. We went into the house, down the hall, and into her bedroom. I have to see to the mulatto rice. You sit on my bed and look at the picture on the wall. She went on to the kitchen. I was still holding the broom handle and now put it down across the bed and climbed up beside it, surrounded by her room, an old woman's room with its 50 years of perfume, powder, and sweet soap. I felt a long way from the corner in Valentine's gang. There were three pictures on the wall, and I was not certain which one she wanted me to study. The smallest was of my granduncle Wilford, who lived on Long Island and came to Thanksgiving dinner. The largest was of Jesus, the fingers of his right hand crossed and held up, his left hand bearing his chest, in the middle of which was his heart, red and dripping blood. In the cool darkness of the room, he looked at me with gentle eyes, a slight smile on his lips. The third was my grandmother's husband, who had died so long before that I had never known him and had no feeling for him as my grandfather. He was light like my grandmother, but more like some of the short, sallow Italian men who lived on the block. His black hair was parted in the middle. He wore a big mustache, which hid his mouth. His jaw was square and dimpled. With black eyes, he seemed to look at something just above my head. Well, all right now. My grandmother came in, sweating from standing over the stove and sat in a small armchair beside the bed. Did you look at the picture? I didn't know which one. I looked at Jesus again. No, not him this time, this one. She indicated her husband. I meant him. So I will stop there. I didn't want you to stop. Did I really stop? Oh, man. I said the wrong thing. You got to keep going. I love that story.